is real. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us to come before you tonight for Bible study. We pray that you bless us, Father God. Keep us and speak to us on tonight. That your word will go forth, Lord God, and we can tell other men, women, boys, and girls about the goodness of Jesus the Christ. So in Jesus' name, we pray and we ask it all. Amen. Thank God. is real and he does love us amen? amen he loves us and we all have loved him we ought to love him as he has already loved us but tonight we're looking at acts chapter 12 in the new testament the book is acts the chapter is 12 acts chapter 12 acts chapter 12 in the, the new testament acts chapter 12 We'll be looking at the first 10 verses, first 10 verses, and we're closing out our month of prayer. Of course, we're not going to stop praying, right? No. We're not going to stop praying, but we're closing out our month of prayer. And so tonight we're looking at intercessory prayer, intercessory prayer, intercessory prayer, Acts chapter 12. There was a, a king named... Herod Agrippa the first. Herod Herod Agrippa the first. Herod Agrippa the first. Herod Agrippa the first. 
we will find him in Acts chapter 12. And as we look at Herod Agrippa I, we will find out that he was on the throne and he was the king of Judah. Herod Agrippa I is on the throne. He was the king of Judah. And because he was on the throne, he was a politician. What do politicians do? They do things to appease people so they can get reelected and stay on the throne. So Herod, Herod Agrippa I is on the throne. And while he's on the throne, he is making sure that he continues on the throne. But if you read ahead after you get home, right around verse 21, you'll find out why he didn't say on the throne. The Bible says he did not give God the glory. And then the worms came and ate him up. Herod Agrippa the first. He's on the throne. His job on the throne was to please the Jews. And because the Jews did not like these new disciples that Jesus brought on the scene, they did not agree with Christianity. So Herod began to harass them. He began to harass them. He began to give them trouble. He had already had James killed. He had James killed. James, the Bible said James, the brother of John, had him killed with the sword. And so then he seized, the Bible said he seized, he caught Peter. When he caught Peter, he put Peter in jail. And he put him in jail in order to kill Peter. Somebody said Peter deserved to be in jail. He, he's the cussing Peter. Fighting Peter. He's the cutting Peter. But let me tell you, regardless of how bad we have been, we want God to give us mercy, don't we? Amen. So Peter was seized, he was put in jail, and the Bible says, during this time was the days of unleavened bread. And so on the Passover, during the Passover period, they are not going to kill people. But the night before Peter was killed, something miraculously happened. Let's look at it. Verses 1 through 4, first of all, it says, Now about the time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. What church? The Christian church. Which church? The first century church. Which first century church? The church that was started because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. The church that Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church. And Peter, you're going to be the founding officer. Why did he make Peter the founder? You know, we got some charter members at our churches now, right? We have charter members. And charter members many times want people to know that they charter members. Nah. I asked the question the other day. Who was here when the church got started 30 years ago? The charter members raised that. My, my, my. So people want to know, want others to know when they are charter members. Peter is who Jesus gave the keys to because Peter did what? What did Peter do? What key thing did Peter do to make Jesus say, flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you, but my Father in heaven, I give you the keys to the church. What did Peter do? Peter identified Jesus as the Christ, the Son he, of God. He identified Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. So check this out. Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I am? Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're John. Peter says, you are the Christ. The son of the living God. Jesus says to Peter, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you, but my father in heaven. Let me tell you, you ought to be attentive enough for, to hear from God. 
You ought to be attentive to God enough to hear from him. So he says, flesh and blood does not, did not reveal this unto you, but my father in heaven. So the church is on the move now. The disciples are scattered. Why are they scattered? Because the king is out to kill them. You remember when Jesus was born, a different Herod was on the throne and he wanted to kill Jesus? Let me tell you, Herod is not dead. He's still alive. Herod still want to kill Jesus. Even though Jesus gone on back to heaven, sitting on the right hand of the Father, Herod still want to kill Jesus, want to kill those who represent Jesus, and want to kill the spirit of Jesus. Such it is in the text. James has been killed. Peter has been arrested. But there's a key thing here. While Peter was in jail, they delivered him to four quarters of soldiers. To keep him. Why so many people intended to bring him before the people after the Passover? Four quarters. What does that mean? Four quarters. He delivers, Herod delivers Peter to four quarters of soldiers. What does that mean? Okay, a bunch. That's a good number. Anybody else can get closer than a bunch? Okay? Four quadrants, right? Four quadrants. How many is a quadrant? Four, right? Then four quadrants, right? So, he brought him before four quadrants of soldiers to keep him, intended to kill him, bring him before the people to kill him after the Passover. Verse number five. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer. How much prayer? Constant prayer was offered to God for him by who? By the church. I just stopped by to tell you when the preacher in trouble, the church ought to be praying. It didn't say they were talking about the preacher. It says they were praying for the preacher. It didn't say that 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 he was talking about him. They were talking about him. It didn't say that they were they were saying, I knew that joker wasn't no good anyway. Mm -hmm. nope. It didn't say that the church said, I knew they were going to get him. The Bible says that the church was in consistent, constant, over and over again prayer for the man of God. Mm -hmm. They kept him in prison. Not jail. What's the difference between jail and prison? Some of y'all know. Some of y'all been there. Yeah, you get out prison, you're going to be there. Okay. <laughs> Somebody knows. <laughs> I've had a few. I was a criminal justice. <laughs> so you go to jail, you're going to get out soon. <laughs> they tell me now if you get some tickets and you can go sit, it out, sit, in, on, sit in on the weekend, you don't even have to pay the fine. <laughs> That's if you go to jail. They said you can just sit it out. Your ticket can just sit it out. But some of the people don't want to set it out. They just want to run wild, run wild and, and, and do whatever they want to do. Park where they want to park, speed where they want to speed, act out where they want to act out, but they don't want to go to jail. But they tell me, they tell me that you can go sit it out one weekend, two weekend, three weekends, you can just sit it out. You don't have to pay any money. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. You can just set it out in jail. You can tell I'm going to set my time out. Well, set your time. Look, somebody got the right language there. <laughs> You're going to set it out. So we, when you set it out, you don't have to pay for it. So some people want to just set it out. Why do they want to set it out? Because they don't want to pay the money, right? So when you go to jail, you, knew so, you know sooner or later you're going to get out, right? Well, you're going to get out soon, I'll put it that way. But when you go to prison, you could die in prison. You're going to be there a long time. You're going to wear one color. We went to Mississippi and we were sitting sitting in court and I had my, my wife with me. And we were all sitting on one side, a group of people sitting on this side, Sister Brown. A bunch of people, about 40 people sitting on this side. And they all, Brother Miles, were dressed just alike. 
And my wife, who probably never been to jail, never been to prison, she said, who are all those people over there? <laughs> I mean, all of them. Every last one of them. And Fort Bend County, they got white with big old green stripes on it. In the prison system in, in Texas, they have white clothes all, all the way through, all over. Well, in Mississippi, they got on big old orange uniforms. And Sister Davis thought they were the choir to sing that day, I guess. <laughs> so, who, who are those people? Who are all those people over there? I started to tell her, but the Lord wouldn't let me. I started to tell her, that's, that's the guest choir that's going to sing for the judge today. <laughs> I said, you for real? You, you really for real? <laughs> and I said, well, say, you don't know who those people, and then she began to ask more questions. I said, you need to be quiet in court. <laughs> we'll talk, to, talk about that after, because this is going to be a, a lengthy lesson, I believe. <laughs> so these guys had reported from prison, and they came to court to see what the judge would give them. And 99.9% .9 of them went right back to prison with even more time on top of what they had. And, and in, at least in Texas, when you, when you get arrested, they let you walk in the back room and they put the handcuffs on you and stuff like that. In Mississippi, they make you, they got two chairs facing the wall, facing this way from the wall. They tell you, put your, put your knees in the chair. You face the wall, you're this far from the wall, you face the wall, you with your knees in the chair, and you in court in front of everybody. And when you put your knees in the chair, they're about waist high. So the, the baby will come by and he shackle your feet right there in court. And then he tell you, stand up. When you stand up, they handcuff you with your hand behind you. And then for those that are gonna be there a long time. They got a big old chain wrapped around their waist with handcuffs welded on this side, handcuffs welded on this side. And when they walk, they pay a lollabout together. You can hear them coming. I'm talking about prison. So Peter was in prison. He wasn't on parole. He wasn't in jail. He was in prison, and he was going to prison to die. He had already been sentenced to death. What was the church doing? The church offered constant prayer for Peter. If the church is going to be the church, the church must pray. The church must be called a praying organism. Not an organization. An organization is something that have board members, have, have paid members, or have people who attend on a regular basis. An organism is a living, breathing, moving organism. Living, breathing being. The church is the bride of Christ. The church has vitality. Even during COVID, the church should have stood out. Did we stand out? When the church is challenged, the church goes in prayer. This was a challenge for the church because guess what? They had already set an example with James. And this example sent fear throughout the whole congregation. And when fear comes through the congregation, somebody, everybody, constantly need to talk to God in prayer. Talking about intercession. I mean, talking to God on, on behalf of somebody else. I mean, you are, you are all right right now, but you ought to be calling on God on behalf of someone else. So the church, the entire church was constantly in prayer and they constantly offered prayer to God, the church did. And the church had the same focus. They had the same focus. The prayer was for Peter. Why they wasn't praying for James? He's dead, right? Is there a need for us to pray for someone who's dead? Why not? 
Why don't we pray as some do for those who are dead? Anybody? Because they have already met their final destiny. If they were saved, then they've gone to be with the Lord. If they were not, they've gone to their father in hell. <laughs> <laughs> they've already gone to their final destination. Yeah. Many, many will tell you that they know that President John F. Kennedy went to heaven. And the reason why they know it, because he had a lot of money, and the more money you pay to the Catholic Church, the more prayers are offered up for you, and you own your way to heaven. Now, I'm just told this. This is 13th hand information. So what I'm saying to you is, once you are dead, your works are done. You are not done, but your works are done. So they offered no prayers for Jane, but they did pray for Peter. It says something to us also. We must pray for the living. Regardless of how bad they are, regardless of what they're going through, we shouldn't gossip about it. We ought to pray about it. The Bible says the church constantly offered prayer to God for Peter. And when Herod was about to bring him out, verse number six, when Herod was about to bring him out, that night, Peter was sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door was keeping him in prison. He got two chains on him, two men watching him, and then you got guards outside watching. They didn't want Peter to escape. Let me tell you, the enemy will always do whatever it takes to kill one of God's people. The enemy will always go to great lengths to destroy the ministry of Jesus Christ. We play in church, the enemy is for real. We pray when we want something. The enemy is, is praying on us every moment of the day. While we sleep, the enemy is planning. While we fight each other, the enemy is planning. While denominations are fighting over this and that, stuff that really doesn't matter when it comes to salvation, the enemy is after us. We got people that are fighting about anything. I mean, any and everything. I mean, you got, you got people who are really fighting more over animals than they do human beings. They will beat down and kill a human being and will get off. But if you shoot or run over a dog, a cow, a hog, you will get life in prison. I mean, Michael Vick's stats would have been just out of this world. But he fought dogs. He fought dogs. Whereas you have men who kill other men and they get three months. The Capitol riots, six weeks, two months, maybe a year. What I'm saying to you is. We cannot put stuff in animals ahead of human beings with souls. We have to be more concerned about souls than we are concerned about things. Therefore, we need to pray. The, the Bible said Peter will sleep. Ooh, look, he's in prison and sleep. He's going to get killed the next morning and he's sleep. You don't think he was nervous? You don't think he's worried about it? If you're going to have faith, don't fear. If you're going to worry, don't pray. You might as well go to sleep because God is up. You pacing the floor, God wants you to go to sleep because he never sleeps nor slumbers. If you're going to have faith, you ought to talk like you have faith. You ought to act like you have faith. Amen. And then the thing about it is, you might as well get some sleep if you're going to get killed in the morning anyway. At least you'll be rested. <laughs> <laughs> Think 
The Bible said Peter was asleep. He was asleep. You, you might as well go to sleep. Children, bad actors, you might as well go to sleep. Pray and go to sleep. The Bible said Peter was sleeping and he was bound while he was sleeping. I see guys tussling with police officers. I mean, make a light on yourself. The city of Houston got way more police officers than you can take down. I see guys run away in cars. I mean, you can't outrun a radio transmission. You can't, you can't, you, they just let you drive and they just ride behind you. I used to wonder why they just ride, slowly ride behind you. They're not making any moves. They're setting up a strategy, first of all. And then sooner or later, you're going to run out of gas. So one of them take you from South Houston to North Houston, he bags off, then somebody else picks you up. They will never run out of gas. At the first of their shift, they gas up and they let their car run all night. And I watch guys that come to the conclusion that I'm going to whoop all these police officers. Are you with me? Peter was asleep. Peter was bound with two chains. He was between two soldiers. And then he had guards before the door, outside the door, keeping him in prison. Peter looked at him. There ain't no sense of me fighting all them. I'm going to sleep. I mean, the Texas Ranger has, has fooled a lot of us. I mean, he has fooled a lot of us. I mean, he takes out five, six, seven people at one time. So he's asleep. He's in prison. He's chained. But the church is praying. And when the church prays, Something happens. When Jesus hears the voice, when God hears the voice, one voice in unison of Jesus' bride, something happens. Let me tell you, the church ought to be in prayer. The church ought to be praying. We ought not just pray once, one month a year or once a year. We ought to pray constantly. The Bible says constant prayer was offered to God on behalf of Peter. I don't know what they asked God to do, but one thing God did is set him free. So evidently they asked him to set him free. The problem with many churches is that we pray, but we don't pray and believe. We ask God to do something, and if he doesn't do it right now, we're done with that prayer thing. And prayer doesn't cost a dollar. Prayer doesn't cost a plug nickel. Prayer doesn't cost anything. That's one privilege God has given the believer. Amen. Is that you can talk to me anytime. And he has made it so easy on us in the 21st century. Is that now we can go boldly before him. Because Jesus has ripped the veil from top to bottom. We don't even have to go through the priests anymore. We don't have to have doves and goats and cows. We don't have to have any animals when we go before the Lord anymore. God has made it so simple until man makes it so hard. Can somebody tell me why we don't pray? Why don't, okay, not you. Why don't other people pray? What's, what's the reason you've heard that people don't pray? The reason why people don't pray? Because God ain't going to answer. Because God is not going to answer. Let me tell you a secret. If you don't pray, he should not go answer. I told you that last week. God doesn't answer unprayed prayers. So if you don't ask him anything, if you don't request of him, if you don't bless him, no, he's not going to answer. So some people don't pray because he doesn't answer. Anybody else? Why don't, why don't people pray? Why don't people just call on God? Why don't people just talk to God? Why don't people have a good fellowship with him? Anybody? I think that um, in our society today, they look at uh, how they can pro the prophesy, the pro people that prophesy. And uh, they think, well, and they want everything right now, as you said, but I pray with God. But I think they don't because they just don't believe. Okay, they don't pray because they don't believe. Mm -hmm. 
That's another reason God doesn't answer with our prayers. Because we don't believe. We don't pray because we don't believe God's going to answer. We don't pray because we don't have faith that God would answer. Anybody else? Some people think they can handle it themselves. Oh, people think that they can handle it themselves. People think that they can handle it all by themselves. And let me tell you, there are people who are narcissists, that are narcissistic. They believe that they got up by themselves. They believe that they can do everything by themselves. And they believe that they can keep themselves. Let me tell you, we need people who are playing. Coach L. M. Brown, Coach Leonard M. Brown was my basketball coach at Gentry High School 40 some years ago. And he wasn't a church going man. He didn't talk about God all the time, but he did. He said two things that, that stood out. If somebody was getting in trouble, he said, sit down, Nicodemus. <laughs> sit down, Nicodemus. Nicodemus, sit down. Everybody was Nicodemus that got in trouble. The second thing he said that stands out even 45 years later, he said to me, and he said to others, the only reason the earth is still spinning on its axis is because people are still praying. He said, if people stop praying, the earth will stop spinning on his axis. He said, the only reason we still exist is because people of God are praying. If that's the case, can we pray and things still happen? If that's the case, and I believe that the late L.M. Brown was correct, I believe Coach was right, I believe that he was spot on when he said, the reason why the earth is still spinning on its axis is because there are some God-fearing people still praying. People of the church are the prayer. So the text says that they were in prayer for Peter and they were off in constant prayer. They didn't stop praying. That didn't mean that they didn't stop and eat. That didn't mean that they didn't stop and sleep. But they were in constant prayer. But the problem with churches that pray, we don't believe that God had answered. I oftentimes tell the story about a church that would walk out of the community down to the church every day. They were praying God sent us some rain. The church, if anybody going to pray for rain, the church ought to pray for rain. It was a drought. They were farmers. They were farmer wives, former children. They farmed on the land. They grew their own crops. So every day, they would leave the neighborhood and walk down to the church and they would pray. Every day, they were, they were, the wino was sitting on the porch watching them. Every single day, after the wino watched them for seven days, going to the church, he stopped them on their way back. And the wino said, y'all don't believe in prayer. What do you mean? We do believe in prayer. Why do you think we're going down to the church every day praying? He said, because you don't believe, and I know why you don't believe. And I'm going to tell you why I say you don't believe. You don't believe that God is going to answer your prayer. Why are you, why are you praying? We're praying for rain. You don't believe that God is going to answer your prayer. Well, why do you say that? They tried to brush the wine off. He said, because I don't see not one of you all with an umbrella. If you believe that God is going to answer your prayer, you would have had an umbrella when you walked down there. You would have believed the first day you would have, y'all would all would have packed umbrellas down there. But because you didn't believe, matter of fact, I know you didn't believe, and guess what? God is not going to answer. Because you don't believe. The third reason prayers don't get answered is because James says we pray a mist. We pray with the wrong motives. Here we are asking for God to do something for us, something that we want, something that we need. We're praying that God does it for us. And guess what? We pray with the wrong motives in mind. We pray so we can get our stuff. We pray so we can get things that, that we want. But when we pray, we ought to pray that God is glorified. 
That's what baby blessings are all about. That's what, that's what it's all about. When you bring baby before the Lord and ask the Lord to bless him, you're giving God back. This is the symbol of it. You're giving God back what God has already given you. And you're asking God, God, have mercy. Bless what you've given to me to be given back to you. Bless what you've given to me to glorify you, Lord. That's why we have baby blessings. We want to glorify God. James said we pray with the wrong motives. We pray amidst. We, we pray. We pray with the motives that will benefit us. Sometimes I think people pray just to, to show other folk they can pray. Sometimes people in the middle of that prayer, they stop talking to God, stop talking to the people in the pews. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm sitting there listening to prayer, and all of a sudden the person that's praying starts talking to Susie Ann over there. And when she gets through talking to Susie Ann, she goes right back to talking to God. And when people pray amiss, sometimes they pray, and when they pray, they want to make sure that folk hear them. And then they have the audacity, the gall, the nerve to say, what kind of prayer did I pray? Did I pray a good prayer? What's a good prayer, Brother Miles? What's a good prayer, Sister Davis? What's a good prayer, Sister Woods? What's a good prayer? Brother McGill, what's a good prayer? Should we be asking people, did we pray a good prayer? Why not? You're talking to God, right? Doesn't matter what they think of the prayer. That's right. So, this is the question. Do we pray differently when we're praying in public than we pray in secret? Does our, is it, are our words different? Are our mannerism different? Is our voice tone different? And let me tell you something. Back home, the old deacons could pray. Boy, you could feel it felt like fire going to come from heaven at any time. They knew how to call on God. But this is what I found out. Those same men that called on God on Sunday morning, if you walk past their house, you hear the same enthusiasm as they're on their knees in the morning and on their knees at night. They pray with enthusiasm in private as well as in public. Is your prayer life different in public than it is in private? Do you pray with enthusiasm so people can hear you? Do you pray with enthusiasm because you want God to know that you're enthusiastic about him? James said we pray amiss. We pray with the wrong goals, the wrong motives, and the wrong challenges for the wrong people. We're talking to God. I always say, I'm singing to the Lord, Brother Miles. I'm giving back to God what God has given to me. And I always say, I'm not, I'm not singing for you. I'm just giving back to God what God's given to me. So we ought to be praying, prayerful. We ought to pray consistently. And we're talking about interceding in prayer. Verse 7. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him. Stood by who? Peter. In a light shone in the prison. Obviously, it was dark. It was dark. A light shone in the prison by him. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. Now let me tell you, this wasn't a little timid angel. This angel walked in there past four quadrants of God. <laughs> this angel walked in there Past the, the guards was out that were outside of the prison. He walked past the guards that were right outside the door of the prison. This angel walked beside the two guards, walked right past the two guards that was right there with Peter. And check this out. This angel didn't even, it didn't matter to this angel whether he was shackled, chained, or handcuffed. This was a timid angel. God knows who to send to get us blessed. God knows who to send 
to bless us. When God wants to deliver us, God knows how to deliver us. We've been waiting on God to deliver us all these years. Guess what? God knows, God sees, and God will deliver. That's why we pray. We pray because God is the one that's going to deliver. I'm trusting him to deliver. Doctors are, are sorry now than they ever been. And this was before COVID-19. I mean, doctors, they still getting paid. They want to spend 10 minutes with you. And by the time you answer their question, they ask you a question while they're getting up out the seat. Mm -hmm. yeah. And by the time you get ready to hear their answer, they say, well, my nurse will be in here to write you a prescription. Mm -hmm. and, and they're out of here. Am I lying on them? No. Doctors, today, we need to call on Jesus. And that's why we need to pray for the doctor. We need to pray, Lord, give him wisdom, give her wisdom, knowledge, understanding, give her an understanding in such a way, give him an understanding in such a way, lead him even if he doesn't got doesn't have time to be led. Be praying for your doctor. You know what I've discovered? You have to pray for the doctor's aides, too. <laughs> Went to the doctor. Gave some vital signs, and they never called me with the results. I called them back, the urine still sitting on the desk a week later. So I go in there, and I ring the doctor. I give him a really good, and all he could say, I'm sorry, I forgot. I said, man, I went to the emergency room over the weekend. That cost me money because you didn't see that I had an infection. And all he could say, man, all I can tell you is I'm sorry. And while I'm sitting there, after I give him more urine, I call back the next week and that same urine, the second batch, has not moved. Doctors. Doctors. And this is after I've gone to the, to the emergency room, after I've talked to him real, real harshly. She didn't get the next one taken care of again. God knows where to send you. That's why you need to be praying. God, send me where I need to be. Bless me to see who I need to see. God, order my steps in your word. God, make sure that I come in contact with the right person who will treat me right, do me right, act right. Lord, make a way out of nowhere. Thank you. One preacher says, the angels of the Lord is watching over me. So when he got ready, I went to the revival. He got, he said, he said, when he got out of the car, he said, now, some of you angels stay here with my car. Other you angels help my health to stand up during the revival. And the rest of y'all just come on, go with me. God has an angel. He has angels who watch over us all night long. And because God has angels, we need to understand we have to pray. Spend some time with God. I know that we're in a microwave situation here. I know everybody wants everything right now. God, do it right now. God, do it. Please, God, do it right now. But sometimes you got to spend some time alone with God. And then we need to be interceding for other people. Matter of fact, other people ought to call us every now and then and say, I need you to intercede for me. I'm in a tough situation. I'm in a tough spot. I, I'm going through some things. I'm about to make a decision. Somebody ought to call you every now and then because they know you're a prayer warrior. I'm convinced that those who call themselves prayer warriors are more talking warriors than they are prayer warriors. I didn't say the church was in talk. The church was in prayer. And when the church is in prayer, things happen. When God, when God blesses, he blesses the church that prays. I want to be a part of a church that prays. It, it did so, it did me so, so, it did me such a, it was such a good thing, good feeling 
when the lady who had left the church came back to our church and said, this is the church that prayed for me last time I was sick. And even though, and I'm paraphrasing, even though I'm at another church now, I came back to this church because I need you all to pray for me. Now, does that, that mean that God always answers our prayer the way we want him to answer? No. But we ought to have the volition to pray. We ought to have the volition to just intercede for somebody else. Other than ourselves, other than our family, other than our friends, we ought to intercede for people. Even intercede for those who are in the utmost parts of the world. We ought to pray. So the angel shined a light. The angel struck Peter on his side and raised him up. When God wants to bless you, sometimes he can't put it in your hands. When, when God wants to bless you, God has to take total control. That's why sometimes when we pray for ourselves, we have to say, God, deliver me from me. Because God, I messed it up. I, matter of fact, God, I messed it up last time. <laughs> now God, deliver me from me. So the church should be praying. And so he struck him and raised him up. And then he did not say in a timid way. He said in a strong, imperative way, he said, arise quickly. But that would have thrown about 90% of the people I know off right there. Get up. That would have thrown about 80% of them off. Get up quickly. 90% of them would have been, what are you talking about? I, I'm not a night person. I'm not a morning person. I can't, I can't handle this. You, you put too much on me. The Lord said, I, I won't put on you any more than I, you can bear. Your life is at stake. The angel said, get up, and I mean get up right now, and do it quickly. Do it quickly. The angel said, get up, arise, arise, quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. He obeyed the angel. He obeyed, he obeyed the ambassador of God, and the chains just fell off. God does miraculous things for us. God does things for us that we can't do for ourselves. What we do is that we try to fight, we try to wrestle, we, have, we try to reason it out. The Bible says after he obeyed the angel, the chain just fell off. Things that we try to do on our own, God is putting us in a position to bless us. Just follow God's instructions. The Bible said a chain fell off his hands. Verse number eight. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself. Tie on your sandals. Saying, get yourself together. God will bother us when we still sleep. Many preachers will tell you that they felt like they were being called to preach in their sleep and they would be awakened in the middle of the night. Brother Miles, you being awakened in the middle of the night? What, cars passing by? <laughs> they will tell you that. They're being awakened in the middle of the night and the Bible is right there and they have to go and read the Bible. Brother Miles? Can't sleep at night? Go read. Go study. Go hear from the Lord. Catch up on your Bible reading. Catch up on your Bible listening. He says, gird up yourself. Tie up your sandals. Put your shoes on. And guess what? So he did. So he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. Put your shoes on. Put your sandals on. Put your clothes on. Follow me. Put on your garments. Put on your garment and follow me. Verse number nine. So he went out and followed him. He did not get permission. He did not get permission from the gods. 
The problem is sometimes you getting permission for people that are not there to give you permission. The devil doesn't need to give you permission to obey God. He says, he says, put on your garment, follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know what was done by the angel, if it was real or not. He did not know what was done by the angel was real. Let me tell you, you have to follow God when you don't know everything. Some people want to follow God and they want God to paint a whole canvas for them. God says to Abraham, get up and leave your kindreds. Get up and leave your gods. Get up and leave your kinfolk. Get up and leave your people and I will show you the way. I'll show you where to go. And that's why he's a father of faith. Then he takes his son that he'd been praying for all these years it took a, took a century to have this baby. Then God says, go and kill him, sacrifice him. And Abraham obeys him. He didn't even know. He didn't even know that there was going to be a lamb caught in the thickets. But he obeyed him. The Bible says that Peter went and he didn't even know what was going on. He did not know what was done by the angel was real but thought he was seeing a vision. He thought he was in a, in a trance. He thought he was visualizing this stuff. And let me just tell you, if you're going to see a vision, it needs to be a positive vision. Too many negative folk, too many people, they don't see anything but negativity. You tell them it's going to be all right? Now, I know it's going to be all right when Jesus gets back. Sound like Mary or Martha. He said, I know my brother, we will see him again in the resurrection. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Though he was dead, yet will he live again. He didn't even know what was going on. He thought it was a vision. He thought he was seeing a vision. He thought that, that things were happening wasn't real. And there, there's a group of people who believe that good things happen to other folk but don't happen to them. How many of y'all like that? Good things happen to other people, but, but it never happens to me. I can't be that lucky. Well, you shouldn't be looking at luck anyway. That's right. God has never blessed me like that. Well, maybe it's because you can't stand the blessing. I, I've never seen God bless me the way he keeps blessing those people. Well, maybe they are not praying amiss. And besides, rain must fall on the just as well as the unjust. Rain must fall on the just as well as the unjust. Are you with me? All of us got to go through something. Peter had to go through prison. I bet you they, if once, once those disciples saw James getting killed, you know, disciples like running now. They, they like running. The women showed up, but the men didn't. The disciples, the disciples saw James get killed. Now Peter's in prison, but Peter had the nerve to sleep. So the Bible says that he didn't know whether it was real or not. He thought he was seeing vision. Then verse 10 says, when they were past the first and the second God post. In other words, he, they passed two stations already. When they passed the first and the second God post, they came to the iron gate that led to the city, which opened and opened to them of its own accord. What is he saying? They didn't walk up and say, open sesame. They didn't walk up and say, ding, 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 ding. they walked up and God opened the gate. Let me tell you something. God he specializes in opening iron gates. Are you with me? What? They do it, preach with it. God specializes in opening even iron gate. When the wooden gate, God just opened the gate. When God wants to bless you, He knows how to open the gate. When God wants to do things for you, He knows how to create miracles for you. When God 
wants to bless you, God can bless you like nobody else can. The Bible said he opened the iron gate that led to the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out. When God opened the gate, you better go out. Some folk got, got trouble with their friends, their family, got trouble with their loved ones, with their significant ones. They got trouble, and guess what? They get out of trouble and get right back in. The Bible said that Peter got out there, and he went through the city. When the gate is open, and, and guess what? It doesn't say that Peter looked back. Some people come to the conclusion like, like Pharaoh, I want one more night with the frogs. Well, do you want me to take the frogs? Like, no, give me one more night with the frogs. I want to be cursed one more night. <laughs> the Bible said that the gate is open, and, and they, the guard, they went past the guard post. They came to the iron gate. And, and this gate led to the city, which was open to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street. And immediately the angel departed from him. When God is through blessing you, God disappeared. <laughs> when the angel got through, the angel just left. My job is finished here. Isn't that something? God has a way of blessing us even in spite of us. Even in spite of your cussing. Even in spite of your, fight, your fighting. Even in spite of your fussing. God can still bless you. That's why when we give the invitation, doesn't matter what you've done. God is able to bless you. God is able to use you. Regardless of your, your circumstances, regardless of lack of money, God is able to use you. Children talking about money to go to school. Just go to school. And keep praying. Keep praying. I made it through every last one of my degrees on other folk prayers. In a season. The church praying for me. Praying. Just one librarian back home, Miss Russian, Miss, Miss Russian made the statement my senior year. She said that Matthew Davis would do good at a big school, but he can't afford it. And she was right. You see how children, Sister Brown, what children do is their junior and their senior year, they want to tell people how I'm going to University of North Texas. I'm, I'm going to TSU. I'm, I'm going to these big glamorous schools. I'm going to University of Texas. And then they get started and they get, this ain't for me. That's why I tell everybody, junior college, community college, is four times cheaper. The same degree that you can get associate, you can get an associate and move right into your career. And that same two year study is four times cheaper. It doesn't come with the glamour and the grand grandeur that everybody's looking for. But you're not here to impress people. You're here to get an education. And those same ones, many of them, have to come back. HCC becomes very attractive. Or the streets become attractive. Or jobs with low pay become attractive. The Bible said we pray amiss. We, we pray with the wrong motive. And many times we act out with the wrong motives. We got to be like the first century church. The first century church, when they got in trouble, they had a relationship with God, a fellowship with God where they went down to prayer. We can't be like the Israelites. We pray as long as things are going well or we pray as long as we need something. The Bible said this church was constantly in prayer. Constantly in prayer. Over and over again, they constantly praying. They constantly praying. And they, had, they were praying on one accord. And because they were on one accord, the gate opened on its own accord. I said the gate, the gate open. This iron gate open because the church was in prayer. Will you find somebody else you can pray with? Somebody else you can, for which you can pray? Intercede for somebody. Because you got yours, make sure that somebody else gets theirs. Teachers have become sorry. 
parents have become, the teachers have become sorry because parents have become sorry. You got doctors, teachers, these are the greatest professions ever. Teachers make all the occupations happen, right? But guess what? They can't teach because they got to be a referee. They can't teach because they got to fight parents. No teacher ever had to fight my mom and dad. And whatever they said was true. They could make up the biggest, black, ugly lie they could, but mom and dad is considered it gospel. Now we got parents fighting teachers. Jesus paid for it. For our right to pray. Gave his life for it on Calvary. Died and rose for it. And we ought to call on him. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus. He is able to, to hear your prayer. And answer your prayer. Will you try? If you've never received Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your moment. Would you bow your head with me and invite him into your life? And ask him to be your Savior. And he will be your Savior and your Lord. Just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. Now come into my life and make me a new person. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe that you honestly prayed this prayer and invited Christ into your life. You're now born again. And when you die, you're on your way to heaven. If you want to be a member of the New Beginning Church, which I recommend, you can be a local member or a global member. I invite you to come and join us at 4251 Chiramai Road, Houston, Texas. That's 4251 Chiramai Road, Houston, Texas, 774, 77048. 4251 Chiramai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048. Inbox us and let us know if you participated tonight. Inbox us and let us know if you received Jesus Christ tonight. We're looking forward to hearing from you. We'll ask Sister Darrington to come and, and, and lead us in prayer for, for the church as a whole, the, the uh, universal church. Lord, grow them nearer. Let them know that you are 
the one. You are our Savior. Lord, let them go back to their roots. Let us all come back to our roots, Lord. Lord, I'm praying for those that may be bereaved tonight, Lord. I'm praying for those that don't know you in the pardon of their sins. Give them strength, Lord. Open their eyes. Let them see that there's only one way to heaven, and it is that is through you. Lord Jesus, I may not be praying the right prayer, but I'm praying the prayer that I feel in my heart. Lord, lift me up and show me the way. I need you, Master. We all do. As again, I say for this sin sick world, a universal prayer for everybody to take heed to what's going on, what's happening, where they will go, that others need them. Let us understand that others need us, not just our family, people on the street. If thanks for a dollar, give them a dollar. It won't hurt you none. Don't let anybody stray you and say, Oh, they got government things for them. Lord, because you don't know what angel you put in my midst. So I am will go ahead and do that. Lord, I ask that you keep me and keep us all here, Lord, in your hands. I've had many trials and tribulations, Lord, but you keep bringing us through. Our church as well. Lord, I'd like to ask you to keep the young children that's here in our church, they are featured. And they are so brave. Lord, keep them, their parents, to keep bringing them in and knowing the Lord. Lord Jesus, I ask you to guide me and lead me and keep us all in prayer. We were given a book, Lord, to study from Genesis to Revelation. Let us pick up something in there that will touch the whole world. The whole world, if you're listening, read it. At least Genesis. God created the heaven and earth, and it was good. Just let people know that we didn't come here by ourselves or just fly down. And if you were brought up in the church, come back to church. I'm called to speak into the absentee. On our calendar, it says, don't be an absentee, be an attendee. That means get out of the Facebook. Come on to church. It's safe. If we're still coming, it's safe. It's okay to take the test. Lord, show people that you made that provision for them and that they should take heed. We should all take heed. Take care of ourselves. God don't do it. But we have to go ahead and step forth and do it. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray this prayer. Lord, show me. Show us all the way that we should go. And after Sister Davis prayed, somebody prayed for me. I know they did. I'm getting a little happy now. So I'm going to go ahead and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Touch the world, Lord, everywhere. Hurricanes, tornadoes, where they never saw it before. But they, oh, I just don't know. Let them know that was you. You're trying to show them something. You're trying to show us all something. So take heed. Meditation. My time, I say they meditate. Oh, they, I read the Bible, Jesus will. Why did he weep? You have to know why he will. So thank you, Lord, for me having a chance to come and speak to you, for everyone. Amen. Good time to give to the Lord. For those of you who are giving electronically, you can do so 
by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gifts, you can mail it in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you so much for joining us in Bible study tonight. Uh, we still have on our prayer list Brother Malvin White. We're praying for Brother Malvin White for his health and his strength. We're also praying for Brother James Whitlock. Brother James Whitlock is the father of Brother Kevin Whitlock. He needs our prayer. We're praying for the Jordan family. We're praying for the Jordan family as well as Omar Galvan. We're praying for Omar yeah, man. We're also praying for uh, Robert Funberger. We're lifting up Brother Robert Funberger. His wife went home to be with the Lord today. And they were married over 68 years. So we're lifting up Brother Robert Funberger. First of all, we're lifting him up for bereavement. And also we're lifting up him for health as, as his wife transitioned. Uh, he is... Uh, it is worse right now, and he really need our prayer. Brother Robert Frumberger, we want to lift him, lift him in prayer. We want God to continue to bless him in this time of bereavement, in this time of sickness. So let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We come lifting these before you, Father. Lord, we know you as Jehovah Rapha. You are the one who heals us. You're the one who makes us well. We know you as the great comforter. You're the one who speaks to us and comfort us in the midst of our bereavement. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for each of you, these who we brought before you. We ask you to touch as only you can, minister as only you can, bless as only you can, heal and deliver as only you can. Lord, you delivered others. We ask you to deliver them. Give them focus. Give them help. Give them hope. Lord, we ask you to bless them and their families even right now. Bless them, Father God, that they will walk with you and they will see you as who you are. Lord, we know you, Father God, as the great God, the great I am, the one who blesses us. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless them. We come now interceding for them, and we thank you for it. We're looking forward to the victory. We're looking forward to the miracles. We thank you, Father God, for what you do and how you do it. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Let us all sing together. Amen. Amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.